that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive this message. We ask um, that your Holy Spirit will reign upon us and that you will do a mighty work in our lives, Lord. Help us to gain some wisdom out of this lesson, Lord, so that we can apply it to our lives and most of all share it with the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So this is uh, this is actually the last lesson of this quarter. You guys enjoyed this quarterly book of Acts. It's been it's been uh, it's been powerful here. Very very powerful. I've enjoyed it a lot. I've read the book of Acts bef before, but when you really study it, it's 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 it's, it's powerful. So we're looking at today the journey to Rome, and uh, we know how. We know what Paul has gone through for the, the last few lessons here, <clears throat> but I want to give you guys a quick recap. Four, uh, four little points here of what happened to Paul previously, and then we'll get into today's lesson. So, the first, uh, the first point is, despite the false accusations against Paul from the Jews, he was granted a fair trial by the Roman government. So, Felix... Festus, he was granted a fair trial, and he was falsely accused because of his faith. Uh, point number two, both Festus and Felix did not have Paul's interest at heart. They didn't, they didn't care about this guy. They were just trying, you know, they, they didn't care about him, but were, they were in favor of appeasing the Jews to prolong the trial, okay? Uh, point number three, the Holy Spirit used Paul to convict which uh, governor? Agrippa, remember that? But what, what did Agrippa do? He rejected God's calling. He said, you almost made me a Christian, Paul, by your testimony. Not quite, huh? Point number four, Paul, in his defense, gives his testimony before the governors of Rome to confirm how God has led him uh, in the past to the present. Okay, so that's where we are now. And now, the journey to Rome. So what I'm going to do, let me read this little short introduction to you, kind of give you a little up to speed of where we're, going to, where we're going with this lesson. This is on the first page here where it says journey to Rome. It says it's despite. Despite the setback, Jesus himself promised that the apostle would still testify of him in Rome. Even when we fail him, God may still give us another chance, though he does not always spare us from the consequences or actions, as we will see in this lesson right here. So selling to Rome, Sunday's lesson. <clears throat> now I, I, I can only imagine the the rough, uh, the the rough ride and the consequences and and just being on the boat. Could you imagine being on this boat and the waves? Just think of you've seen, you know, probably show uh, uh, mo maybe movie in the past or shows with big waves all around the boat and you, and, and it looked like it's going to swallow you up. This was the condition that we're in. So before we, we um, I ask you guys questions here, let's look at a text here, and it's found in Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, and the verse is going to be verse 11. Isaiah 55 and verse 11. And it says, so, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me, what? Void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Okay? Now, this goes along with the memory verse for today, which, is, which says, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. So we know whatever God says, it will be accomplished, even through the storm, right? Even through the storm, okay? No matter the circumstances. So what warning in this, in Sunday's lesson, what warning did Paul give to the sailors about the journey ahead? What did he say to them? What was that, sister? Ships would be damaged, but there would be no loss of life, you know? And 
what else did Paul say? What was that? Don't go right now. Wait out the storm. Yep. Now, did they listen to him? They did not listen to him. So they decided to proceed. They decided to proceed despite the treacherous situations. But let me ask you this. Was it God's plan not to go through the storm? Was it God's plan not to go? Even though Paul said, you got, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous about what's ahead because you guys see all this treacherous, you know, the waves coming up and, all, you know, our ship is about to be tossed, <laughs> turned upside down. So it, was, it, it actually was God's plan for them to go through the storm, as we'll read later on. But let's look at a few, a key, some key verses here. Uh, Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27, starting at verse 21. Acts chapter 27, starting at verse 21. Now, this is after Paul told him, hey, you know, I don't, I don't think this is a good idea, guys, for us to proceed. So look what happens in verse 21. It says, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have what? Hearken unto you. You should have listened to me. And not have loose from Crete to have gained this harm and loss. And now I ex exhort you or encourage you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. Okay? So nobody is going to lose their life. Now, how did he know this? Verse uh Verse 23, for there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee, have given thee all of them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I have, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told to me. Verse 26, how be it we must be cast upon a certain island, okay? So, many times God, he allows us to go through storms for specific reasons. What are some of those reasons? Because this was a big storm. Now we're talking about, we're talking in the spiritual, out in the spiritual realm. A lot of times he, now who's been through a storm in, in your spiritual life? If you ain't been through, if you ain't been through a storm, you, where you been? <laughs> because as soon as you give your life to Christ, but here's the, here comes the devil with, with all his power trying to trying to throw at your, you know, trying to throw at you, you see? But it's not only that, it's preparing us also for the storm that's coming ahead, too. Exactly. Cause it's not always us. Sometimes when things happen to us, we think it's because of us. If it means to save somebody else. And we have to go by what the word said. The Lord, yes, he can heal. Yes, he can whatever it is. But he came to save. So by whatever means necessary. And that's why the memory text is so important. Make it personal. Do not be afraid, Jackie, or whatever your name is. You must stand before Caesar. It may not be the physical Caesar, but we're going to have a Caesar to stand before. I said the same thing. But I was just, wasn't it, you know, um, didn't Paul already know that he needed to go to Jerusalem? Wasn't this just a confirmation for him? Oh, when, the, when the yeah. angel came to him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he knew he had to go to Rome. Mm -hmm. Remember, right. the church, you know, yeah. Had yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. he knew that he should, he was going to make it there no matter what. Well, you know, he's, he's, go ahead, sister. And I just wanted to emphasize on that point because a lot of the times God tells us that he's got an answer for us, but then we ourselves do not accept it. And then we keep beating ourselves up, and then God says, hey, I told you, we'll take care of it, you know? We just need to leave it up to him. And, and why is it, why, why, we do, why doesn't, why don't we accept it the first time? Because it's, it's out of our comfort zone. The, you know, our fleshly nature, we can't see what God sees. You know, what does God say? My ways are, are higher than your ways. You know, what my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Just, just trust me, and I, I'm going to lead you. <clears throat> so God, do I have a few verses here? <clears throat> These are the points I wrote down on why He takes us through, through the storm, to increase our faith, to mold our characters, 
and to chasten us, to chasten us. So check out these verses here. Uh, check out the first one, 1 Peter 1, 7. 1 Peter 1, chapter 7. get there say amen <clears throat> chapter uh, first Peter 1 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried in the what in the fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ all right powerful verse Matthew 17 20 is the next one Matthew 17 Verse 20. Now, during this process, Paul, he wasn't in favor when he told them before he said, hey, guys, I don't think this is a favorable uh, condition for us to go. They didn't listen to him, so they didn't, they didn't respect him at that time. But now, as we see, as we go on, he exhorted them and said, hey, you guys are not going, because they was probably in fear of their lives. You, you guys are not going to lose your lives. So I'm, I want to encourage you. And Paul was a witness to them immediately right there when he told him about their about his God because a lot of them probably on the boat didn't know God. So as we'll see in the in the later uh, verses here. Matthew 17, 20 says, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place. And it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible for you. So we know a mustard seed is probably that small. You can see that hole right there. <laughs> faith, to increase our faith. Hebrews 12, 6. A couple more here. Hebrews 12, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 6. Uh-huh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. It says, For whom the Lord loves, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receives. So the chastening of the Lord is an act of love. One more, Proverbs 25, verse 4. We're talking about going through the storm here and, these, and, and just bringing out more verses that uh, confirm that and what it does for us in our walk. Proverbs 25, 4. <clears throat> that says, take away the dross from the silver and there shall, there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. You see that? Take away that dross. What is that dross? That's what's keeping us back from falling God all the way. That storm. And there shall become a... So the, who's the finer? God is the finer. He Moses. That's beautiful. All right. So let's check out uh, Monday's lesson. The shipwreck. Now things are starting to intense, big time. So here we see the storm getting much worse to the point where some of the shipmen, they were ready to jump off the boat. The Bible said they're ready to flee. They're ready to jump. Now you know that's bad. If you jump off the boat, you, you, it's done. You're done. Okay, pretty much. Now my question is, and we talked, we just talked about this. Has everyone ever experienced a shipwreck in their spiritual, in their spiritual walk? What's the difference between? Being in this, going through a storm in a shipwreck. A shipwreck, you what? Uh, well, living in Florida, I've been out on a boat a lot and been in weather the worst, <laughs> being in the boat. So what happens is that the waves are constantly pounding on you. So yeah, so it's it and in a cruise ship also, and so this is a nonstop. You have no way to go because no matter where you turn, you're being beat, because the waves come from every angle, and and the ship, you know, the boat loses control. You cannot steer it unless you have someone very proficient on it. So the same thing happens with us spiritually, when we have that that warfare that's going on within us because it's not God, it's within us. We can't see our way out unless we go down on our knees and tell God you are in control and that's what we need to do but until we make that confession to God we are constantly tossed to and fro we don't know we're warring with ourselves you know what can I do what should I do how should I handle this you know what instead of giving it to the Lord and say you know what whatever you decide for me Lord I know that you're going to be with me 
I think, <clears throat> sorry, in the storms of life, especially as a Christian, you have to remember <coughs> excuse me, that in spite of the storm, you're not alone, and it's not going to last forever. That's it. All right. Amen. Thanks for that. The shipwreck. So what's the number one remedy to surviving spiritual shipwrecks? The number one remedy to surviving spiritual shipwrecks. I have the answer for us in Acts chapter 27, starting at verse 33. Acts 27, starting at verse 33. Now Paul here is gaining some respect from, from, some, um, from some of the shipmen. I, I, one in particular that I know of, he's gaining some respect because some of the, the things that he's told them is starting to come to pass. 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is, is the 14th day. So 14 days on, in this stuff that you have tarried and continue fasting, having taken nothing. So these guys, they were so scared, they haven't eaten. Paul said, you guys need to eat. Wherefore, I pray to you, take some meat, for this is your health, for there shall not an hair fall from your head. He had to confirm them once again, nothing's going to happen to you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presses of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Verse 36 then were, were they all good of good cheer, and they also took, took some meat. Okay, so according to those verses, what's the number one remedy to surviving spiritual shipwreck? Breaking bread. <laughs> Was that, that came to your mind too? Taking in God's word, that's what's going to give us the strength. And, you know, he did, he did it amongst uh, probably a lot of unbelievers on the ship. It, the, it says there's over 270 people on the ship. So he's, you know, he's probably praying and people are hearing him. And what was amazing is that Paul went in there as a prisoner. And now he's heading the group. Now he's like the captain. And it's amazing how uh, I... I listened to uh, Pastor Doug Batchelor last night and he was talking about the centurion also. The centurion, the reason why they're called centurions is because it takes a hundred uh, soldiers to elect that person as a centurion. He's like the head person. And the scriptures speak that the centurions, most of them when they're spoken in the scriptures, listen to God's word and they got converted. And so maybe he has something to do with the centurion, with Paul in there, we don't know. But definitely we can see God's put work at hand with Paul. Yes, big time. I think we shouldn't forget whether it's the physical storm as a fisherman or whatever it is in a spiritual storm. We have to let go some of the baggage we have. Amen. You know, that's, right. that's one. Number two, faith without works is dead. Like they had to get rid of stuff. Many of us are praying, Lord, do this. But there's some stuff we have to do. It's like if you need a job, Lord, I pray I get the job. But have you asked? Have you read the circulars? So there's something we have to also do. That's right. Good point. <coughs> yeah, we have to cooperate with God at all times for things to happen. So the points that I had down on the number one remedy is uh, read God's word, number one. We talked about that. How about this? In the storm, be thankful in the storm. It, that's the hardest thing to do. Be, to be thankful in the storm? Wait a minute, my life looks like it's going to perish here, but I, I need to be thankful. Here's a, uh, here's a Bible, here's a scripture on that. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Starting at verse 6. This is a great memory verse right here, guys. Great memory verse. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with what? 
thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There was a, some, some, some words in there that really stuck out to me. Everything, no matter what it is. Prayer, thanksgiving, the peace of God, you see. Paul had peace even though he was going through the storm. Another point, another thing we can do as far as remedy as we uh, hit those uh, spiritual shipwrecks is to encourage others. Encourage others. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So exhort, encourage each other daily in this walk. Powerful. Listen to this right here. I'm, I'm reading um, middle of the page. It says divine providence. <clears throat> Just like you touched on, Sister Jackie, about faith and works. Divine providence does not necessarily exempt us from doing what would, norm, what would normally be our duty. Throughout this narrative, a nice balance is maintained between God's assurance of their safety and the efforts of the people involved in it. Okay? So in, in a nutshell, faith without works is dead. Divine, the divine nature is there for the taking. We ask for it, God would give it to us. However, we have a part to do. And I want to read to you one more verse uh, that goes along with this in this section. First Peter, I mean, I'm sorry, Second Peter, uh, chapter 1. Starting at verse 4, this goes along with the quote I just read there. 2 Peter 1, starting at verse 4, it says, Whereby are giving unto, unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, give all, and this is the, this is the remedy right here. We're talk, talking about remedy, spiritual. And besides this, given all diligence, Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Now, now zoom in on this here, verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm on verse 8 now. It says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 9, one more. But he that lacks these things, what things is that? What we just read above. Is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So the divine nature is going to help us to do all of those characteristics to put on faith, to put on brotherly kindness, to have long suffering, pretty much the fruits of the Spirit. But we have to yield to His calling. We have to be humble for that. Okay? Tuesday's lesson Malta. So we see here, as, as they, this, is, this is the actual wreck happened now. And now they're on the island of, of Malta. So Paul and the rest of the survivors of the storm, they make it to this small island. As we see here, God kept his promise, right? God said you're not going to lose your life. And no life was lost. The people at Malta were very hospitable to Paul and his companions. So what were some key points that happened here in Malta? Very interesting. Very in I got a few points here. They welcomed them. Sure did. They were, but they were kind of skeptical of Paul. They were scared of him. Why would they? Yeah, because of the snake bite. Uh -huh. And they, they thought that um, he was a murderer. Uh -huh. and, and you know what? And, and God was punishing them. Right. Right. They too were, you know, that their minds were changed. Right. Very hospitable people. Very nice people. They took him in. So Paul was bit by a snake, and they looked on him and said, you know, this guy must be a murderer. And what happened 
after they saw that the snake did not harm him. What did they say? What was that, brother? Uh-huh. Immediately, you know, they changed their mind and they start treating uh, a power like a son of God. That was amazing. And we know that was all a miracle. That was a miracle from the Lord in heaven that, he, that nothing happened to him at all. They saw him as a God. So how did Paul ultimately minister to the people at Malta? After this incident, he got bit by a snake. They thought he was a God, little g. And God used Paul in an extreme circ in extreme circumstances because they just got off a sh uh, off a boat. In extreme circumstances, they used him. How how did they how did God use Paul in this little island? What happened? As a healer, to show the manifestations of God, what God could do. You know. Amen. That's right. That's right. So. Looking back, you know, when the storm started, and like we discussed earlier, God would take us through things to, to mold us, but, he, but it's also, he, God has a, always has a bigger purpose to reach masses of people. That's his big purpose right there, to, not to, to save us too, first. And as we minister to others, what, what happens when we minister to, when we, we, we're able to witness to others? We encourage not only ourselves, but we encourage other, other people. We, we'll be a witness to them. So that's what Paul was doing here. So according to the lesson learned from the shipwreck and what we've discussed about Malta, why does God allow the most extreme storms, and we talked about this, to take place in our lives? It's calling us to a higher purpose, right? Yes, it's to build us, it's to to strengthen us, to build character, um, um, several things. Exactly right. In the last paragraph, I like where it says, our mission in the world goes beyond baptisms or church planting. It also involves concern for people and their needs. So when we take our eyes off ourselves, that's what Jesus did. He didn't come here to, to, to be to be selfish. He came. He he came here. He was selfless. He met the needs of other people. And the other point I have here is, he's preparing us to be a witness and a testimonial to mass amount of people. What we just talked about. And that's what it's all about: winning other, winning people, winning souls. Wednesday's lesson. After all of this, after the shipwreck, and after being a, a light to the people in Malta, Paul finally makes it in Rome. Finally. Boy, it's a long journey. Uh, I think the, ship, the, the, uh, the journey at sea was like it said, 400-some miles. Long time. And you think back then, that boat probably wasn't moving that fast. <laughs> you see? So it's amazing. So as Paul, as soon as Paul got to Rome, what, what did he do? What did he do? What was his custom? What was his custom every time he, he got amongst? He got, he went to, the, yeah. But he called the synagogue to him this time. He couldn't go because he was a prisoner. So he called the Jews to him. All right. Um, let's look at Acts 28. Acts 28, starting in verse uh, 17. And it says here, And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or custom of, of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Who, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. 
but when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Right. So the, that's right. So they knew the Jews knew the Old Testament like the back of their hand, right? But you know, you go over to the New Testament, they they rejected they reject Jesus. So if he can quote if he can quote from a, a Old Testament scripture. Because that, that's where their mindset was still at. They were still in the Mosaic Laws. They say, hey, their, their argument against Paul this whole time was simple. The Mosaic Laws, that's what they, they, they believe still stood. Jesus of Nazareth, the resurrection, that's not how we're saved. They, they still believe in the Mosaic Laws. But he captivates them. And the Jews knew the prophets, too. They knew all the prophets. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Now what happened when he read this scripture? What happened? Did they did they believe? It said some believed, some didn't. It was kind of half and half. Some believed, some didn't. When Paul, Paul was talking about, you know, uh, the Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the Jewish people was so hard. They don't want, they don't want to follow what, uh, what God is telling them. And then Paul uh, has to talk to the Gentiles again because the Jewish was no helping, was no supporting him. That's right. Even what he read, they, they weren't trying to. A lot of them, a lot of them heard it, but some weren't. What they weren't trying to hear what he was saying. Colossians two, verse fourteen. Blotting out the handwriting of, of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. What is that talking about? Talking about the ceremonial laws. And we know that those laws were written by Moses in a book, handwriting. You know, people, a lot of people use that and say, oh, see, the law is done away with. It's not true. God wrote the commandments with his finger. Different, difference. Difference. All right. So it was also read, the reason Isaiah was read as well to the, to the Jews was it was a rebuke to them and the Holy Spirit it was a rebuke to the, to the Jews for the Holy Spirit to convict them to hopefully change for them to have a change of heart. For them to have a change of heart. So it was Isaiah. Actually, let's look at let's look at those, just a few verses there. Acts, Acts twenty eight, so you can see what what Paul actually said. Acts twenty eight. Starting at verse 24. Actually, let's start at verse 26. And it says, saying, go unto this people and say, hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see and not perceive. So why does this happen? Verse 27, for the heart of this people is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes, in their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Verse 28, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. So basically he said, you guys, even though you're hearing me, what, is, what does the book of James say? Be not a doer, be, be not just a hearer of the word, but a what? But a doer of the word. They were hearers, but they were not doers. Because the Bible says their heart was wax gross. Wax gross. Let's look at a couple more verses that brings this all together. Proverbs 27, verse 5. Proverbs 27. And verse 5. I love this verse. It says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Ain't that something? 
open rebuke is better than secret love. What does that mean? Open rebuke is better than secret love. If you love somebody, with, if, especially in the, spirit, in, the, in, the, in the Christian walk, if you see them doing something wrong, there's nothing wrong to bring them the word of God and, 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 and politely rebuke, right? Nothing wrong with that. That's better than secret love. Secret love is like, you know, I love you, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm not going to say nothing. You see, God holds us accountable for that, too. Did you hear I saw you. Oh, I thought I saw you. I'm sorry, sister. Isaiah 1, verse 5. Isaiah 1, verse 5. And this is, uh, this is the condition of the Jews at the time. It says, why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Reading down in the middle of the page on Thursday's lesson, where it says Paul's patience. This comes from the Acts of the Apostles, page 464. It says Paul's patience and cheerfulness during his long and unjust imprisonment, his courage and faith were a continual sermon. That's powerful. Everything that Paul went through was a continual sermon. So it's not, a lot of times, it's not about what we say, it's about how we live. People are watching People are watching us every day on how we live, and that's a sermon if we're, following, if we're following God's will. It says here, His spirit, so unlike the spirit of the world, bore witness that a power higher than the that of earth was abiding with him. And by his example, Christians were impelled to greater energy as advocates of the cause from the public labors of which Paul had been withdrawn. In these ways were the apostles' bonds influential, so that when his power and usefulness seemed cut off and to all appearance he could do the, le he could do the least, then it was that he gathered sheaves for Christ in fields from which he seemed wholly excluded. Absolutely, that's, that's powerful. That is powerful. Now check this out. This is this is a this is a call for us. This is a look at what it says at the bottom of the page where it says now it says now it is our turn to add one more chapter, the last one we hope, and bring the mission Jesus left with the disciples to its full completion. And then Jesus says the end will come the end will come so Christ is waiting on, on us yeah, brother, to finish the work one of the lessons that we can learn from Paul Paul was in this situation because he didn't follow God's direction to begin with God never deserted him he stayed with him and was blessed him through what he'd done but Paul decided to go out on his own, and sometimes we all do that. But because we do, God doesn't desert us. And one of the things that this lesson brought out very importantly to me was the fact that when we have uh, visitations with people, we have meetings, we have church and things, because we don't see immediate results doesn't mean that there's not going to be results. We don't know the influence that these things have on people that we never hear of. They go their way, as these people did. Some believed him, some followed him, some accepted him, some didn't. But, and we're not told much about that. But we assume that God was in charge because there again, God led him. Paul still had to suffer the consequences of his decisions, as we do. But God never left him, and that's important for us to know, that God will never leave us as long as we keep him connected with him in prayer. Powerful. That's exactly right. Exactly right. 
And also on the reading that you mentioned about the sheaves uh, that he gathered sheaves for Christ in fields from which he seemed wholly excluded, uh, he was chained to a guard all the time. So that gave him, those guards were able to see how he continued his work with God. So no doubt some of them were converted. Um, it was mentioned uh, in, in some other stories that I've heard that more than likely those went into the house of Rome, you know, this, this, that we mentioned the centurion and other people. The word continued to spread in places where he probably would not have been able to had he gone and knocked on a door. You know, so things open. We don't know where God is guiding us for what purpose. And we just need to be open to that and be ready to, to you know, talk about his word. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah. All this experience of, of uh, Apostle Paul, you know, help us to, uh, you know, to start searching, searching for people, to conduct people to Christ. Uh, that's the only way, I think. So, when you reach heaven. You wouldn't say, God, I'm here, and I'm safe. And God will ask you, where is the rest? Who bring you, you know? Yeah, that's the reason. We need to start practicing, you know, sharing the love of God with others. All right. Great lesson. Let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you for all your participation. Very powerful. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your words to us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will write what we've heard and read this morning upon our hearts, Lord. Help, help us to meditate on it, to apply it, Lord. And, Lord, it, we may be going through storms now. If not, we will go through storms, Lord. And help us to be faithful just as Paul was faithful. And we can only do this by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us a desire, Lord, to know you, know you more, to meditate on what Jesus has done for us. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, to meet together like this because so, we know there's going to come a time where we won't be able to, Lord. So strengthen us now, strengthen our faith, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.